Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another missing video. Everyone knows the story of Elizabeth Smart, right? If you somehow don't, you can Google it or there are tons of videos about her here on YouTube, but she was a 14 year old girl that was kidnapped on June the 5th of 2002 in Salt Lake City, Utah. Her story was all over the news, tons and tons of national media coverage. Everyone was following the story, and thankfully, she was found, rescued, and returned to her family. Now, what most of you probably don't know is that on May the 3rd, 2002, a month prior to Elizabeth Smart going missing, another beautiful little girl also disappeared. She was seven years old and lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Her name is Alexis Patterson, but the national media at the time referred to her as the other missing girl. Alexis's disappearance sadly did not receive a whole lot of national media attention, not even close to the exposure Elizabeth Smart's disappearance got. And we will talk about why later in the video, but hopefully right now we can get Alexis's story out there more. Alexis S. Patterson was born to parents Anaya Patterson and Kenya Campbell on the 4th of April in 1995. She was an absolutely gorgeous little girl who has been described as being bubbly and a little bit bossy with a happy personality. Her favorite color was pink. She loved cheesecake, Mexican food, roller skating, and Alexis, who also went by nicknames Lexi and Pie, always had a big smile on her face. She loved school, she was a really good student, and she adored her six-month-old baby sister, Daisani. She loved being a big sister and helping her mother take care of the baby. In 2002, seven-year-old Alexis was in first grade at High Mount Community School. She lived pretty close to the school, only about a half a block away in a home on 49th Street with her mother, Ayanna Patterson, her baby sister, and her stepfather, Laurent Bourgeois. On the evening of Thursday, May the 2nd, Alexis had not completed her homework correctly as she usually did, and therefore her mother told her as punishment she would not be allowed to take cupcakes to her classmates the following day. It was Alexis's turn to bring something for snack time that Friday. She and her mother had already purchased the cupcakes at the grocery earlier that day, and Alexis was not one bit happy that she was going to have to leave the treats at home and show up to class empty-handed. When you're a kid, these things are a big deal, and she was upset. The following morning, Friday, May the 3rd, Ayana went to work, and around 7.40 to 8 a.m., Alexis's stepdad, Laron, walked Alexis the half block to High Mount Elementary, located at 4921 West Garfield Avenue. He walked her to the crosswalk at 49th and Garfield, and he watched her walk the rest of the way across the street with the school crossing guard that was on duty to the playground on school property. Then he turned around and headed back home. Several students that were out on the playground before the school bell rang say that they saw Alexis outside that morning and that she was visibly upset. She was crying, tears streaming down her face, and she was obviously still distraught about not bringing the cupcakes. Even though these children claimed to have seen her, Alexis never entered the school building that day. She didn't attend class and no teachers or students saw her inside the school. Before this day, Alexis had maintained a perfect school attendance record. She had never missed a day and had never even been late. Ayana did not receive a call from the school that morning letting her know that Alexis didn't come to class. I thought all schools did that. Our schools here do, and they did so back in 2002, but apparently not all do. So Ayana did not find out Alexis didn't attend school until after the school day was over. The school informed her that afternoon that Alexis hadn't shown up, and Alexis also didn't show up at home after school that day. 
Ayana obviously panicked and went straight to the school. Once it was realized by the school and Alexis's parents that she wasn't in either place, school or home, and hadn't been all day long, Milwaukee police were notified and Alexis was reported missing. Now, Milwaukee law enforcement took about an hour to respond to Ayana's call, but when they did get there, they got on it immediately. They took Alexis's disappearance very seriously, thank goodness. They immediately began searching for her around the school, the neighborhoods, and the immediate area. Unfortunately, Wisconsin did not yet have the Amber Alert system in 2002. They did, however, get it the following year in 2003. It was initially believed that Alexis may have ran away because of the argument with her mom over the cupcakes. Maybe Alexis was so upset that she couldn't bear the thought of showing up to class with no cupcakes and having to tell her class they wouldn't be getting a treat that day because she hadn't completed her homework. Some things that seem like small potatoes to us adults are a big deal for kids and Alexis was very upset that day. But Alexis had never run away before or skipped school so this wasn't something they would have expected her to do. Within 24 hours of Alexis being reported missing, police had set up a mobile command unit at Washington Park where they could collect tips and organize the searches. 36 patrol officers, 23 detectives, as well as supervisors worked around the clock trying to find Alexis. Some even continued searching on their days off. Investigators went door to door trying to see if someone, anyone, had information or had seen something that day. Hundreds of volunteers from the community helped search. Thousands of flyers were passed out and hung up wherever they would stick. Divers searched a lagoon that was inside the park. Billboards showing Alexa's face went up all over Milwaukee. They did check into local sex offenders in the area as well as people who had recently been paroled. They used dogs to search vacant buildings in the area, but all of these efforts came up empty-handed. Friends and classmates of Alexis were interviewed, some more than once, and like I already mentioned, they claimed to have seen her before school crying on the playground, and some said they saw her outside after school ended as well. I also want to note that it's believed the crossing guard that was working that day helping kids cross the street before school saw her as well. Some of the students also told police about either a red pickup truck or a late model red GMC SUV. I've seen both reported so I'm unsure which is more accurate. But the vehicle had been parked near the school in the week prior to Alexis disappearing. This truck didn't appear to have any business being there as they weren't picking up or dropping off any students. The truck was just sitting there or kind of slowly driving around as if they were watching. After Alexis disappeared, so did this truck and it was never seen parked by the school again. The driver nor the truck were ever identified so it's unclear if it had anything to do with what happened to Alexis that day or if it was just a coincidence. Family members also have stated that they were told that a dark blue SUV was seen speeding away from the area around the time Alexis was last seen. That vehicle has never been identified either. Now, a couple of weeks before Alexis disappeared, Highmount Elementary had sent a paper home for parents informing them that someone had attempted to abduct a little boy in the area of the school. I'm unsure if this person was caught or all the details on exactly what happened, just that the school wanted parents to be aware and I'm sure have a talk with their kids and to be on the lookout. According to Ayana, Alexis's mom, about a week before Alexis disappeared, a teacher contacted Ayana to let her know that she had seen Alexis talking to a stranger. It was a woman not associated with the school, and Alexis was speaking with her kind of toward the back of the school or behind the school, and 
A couple of days later, Alexis was apparently seen talking to the same woman once again. Ayana did have the whole stranger danger talk with Alexis, warning her not to talk to or go with people she didn't know. I'm unsure if Alexis ever gave an explanation to her mother on who exactly this woman was or what they had talked about. Now, per the usual, they did look into those close to Alexis as often family or someone the child knows is responsible. Alexis's mother, Ayana, and stepfather, Laurent, cooperated fully with police, but suspicion was on Alexis's stepdad pretty much from the start. He did have a past, which included some charges for selling drugs, and he had been the getaway driver in a bank robbery that resulted in the shooting death of Glendale Police Officer Ronald Headbeatty. The bank robbery incident was eight years prior to Alexis going missing, and I'm unsure when the drug charges occurred, but I believe his past and the fact that he was the one who supposedly walked Alexis to school that day I think that is what made police look closely at him as possibly being responsible. I have seen in a couple of articles that Laron didn't normally walk Alexis to school. The Washington Heights neighborhood where they lived is a relatively safe area and a lot of kids walk to school alone and apparently Alexis normally walked by herself too. So. People, I think, kind of thought it was weird that Laurent walked her there on this day, but I don't think it's that strange because they had just recently received that letter from the school about the attempted abduction. If I got a letter like that, I wouldn't be letting my child walk by themselves anywhere. So that's why I assume anyway, he did walk her that day. Ayana, her mother, was probably adamant that Alexis wasn't going to be going by herself. A year after Alexis's disappearance, Laurent took and failed a polygraph test regarding Alexis's disappearance, but exactly what questions they asked him during the test were never released. Laurent was never charged with anything or even named as a suspect, and he adamantly maintained his innocence. Ayana also took a polygraph and she did pass. Alexis's biological father, Kenya, was looked into as well, but he was in jail when she went missing. He was doing time for several charges related to battery and some driving infractions and wasn't released until May 6th, three days after Alexis disappeared, so he had a pretty good alibi. He didn't find out about his daughter's disappearance until he saw on the local news. He also cooperated with police and willingly answered questions and helped with the investigation. On May 14th of 2002, just 11 days after Alexis disappeared, investigators announced that her case had been reclassified as a criminal investigation as they believed Alexis's disappearance was the result of suspicious circumstances. A few months later, they stated that they believed that foul play was involved. In August of 2002, an anonymous caller contacted one of the local television stations and told them that Alexis's remains had been dumped in the Milwaukee River near Estabrook Park. Divers did go there and they did search the river, but nothing was found. In either 2004 or 2005, a prisoner claimed that Alexis had been murdered and her body had been buried somewhere outside of the Baton Rouge Louisiana city limits at a vacant property. Detectives flew out to Louisiana to check it out, but once again, they found nothing. Alexis has black hair and brown eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she was three feet, eight inches tall and weighed 42 pounds. She has a scar under her right eye, a bump on her left pinky finger and a mole above her left eye. Her ears are pierced, and she was last seen wearing a purple shirt, light-colored blue jeans, white and blue high-top Nike sneakers, and a red-headed jacket with gray stripes going horizontally down the sleeves. Her hair was in two French braids combed back into a single ponytail. If Alexis is still alive today, she would be 26 years old. In 2016, a man came forward stating that he believed his ex-wife could be Alexis. 
He claimed that his ex had no memories of her life before the age of 10 years old, nor did she have any photos of herself as a small child. I'm going to refer to this woman only by her first name, Lisa. I don't want to put her full name in the video because I believe she got really overwhelmed with all the media attention and people were really poking and prodding and looking into her life and invading her privacy. Lisa did bear a striking resemblance to age-progressed photos of Alexis and she had three of the same distinguishing characteristics that Alexis had. She had the same scar under her eye the same birthmark in the same spot, and the same bump on her pinky that Alexis had. Lisa thought this claim that she was Alexis was absolutely ridiculous, and she provided a birth certificate and other documentation to police to prove that she was not Alexis. And there was actually quite a large age gap with the provided birth certificate, putting her age as, I believe it was seven or eight years older than Alexis would have been. She willingly took a DNA test and police confirmed her DNA was not a match to Alexis. However, there was some question by Ayana, Alexis's mom, on where they got Alexis's DNA because she hadn't given them any. Today, I got the results on the media. I didn't get a call to after they released it on the media stating that Lisa is not Alexis. Um, I don't believe that. Absolutely not. And the reason why is because I just gave the MPD my DNA yesterday, okay? And they told me, the lieutenant, I talked to the lieutenant today, he told me that they matched Lisa's DNA with the DNA that they got 14 years ago of Alexis's. Well, first of all, who gave you the DNA 14 years ago? You never received the DNA from me. What DNA did you use? From a toothbrush? Nah, 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 nah. Give me the real DNA. Use my DNA. Put my DNA to Elisa's DNA. And take it from there. And if the test come back stating that she's not mine, then that's when I will accept it. But right now, I'm not accepting it because she's too much like me. How does she have the same mold? right here that I have, that my daughters have, and her granddaughter, and her daughter have. She has the same birthmark as Alexis had when Alexis was, was first born. She has the same mark on her eye, the right eye, when my daughter had, okay? She has the same bump, and she has the same mole on her nose right here, too. We're too much alike for this not to be my child. I worry about my daughter every day. I've been worried about my baby for 14 years. You understand? And then now that I finally got a, a nice, uh, 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 I feel like a solid clue, you know what I'm saying, a solid lead, y'all gonna tell me that it's not her? Alexis's case was assigned to the cold case division in 2009, but detectives believe they will one day find out what happened to Alexis. They are adamant that someone in the Milwaukee area knows what happened to her. They just need that one person to come forward. In 2012, it was announced by Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett that May 3rd would be known as Alexis Patterson Forget-Me-Not Day, a day every year to remember Alexis and to remind their community that she is still missing. Milwaukee police included Alexis's image in a pack of cold case playing cards that were sent and distributed to inmates in the jails and prisons across Wisconsin. They were hoping inmates would, you know, play with the cards and would see her picture and maybe realize they knew something and speak up. What happened to little Alexis all those years ago? Was she grabbed outside High Mount Elementary? Did someone lure her away by asking her what was wrong when they saw her crying and then saying, hey, let's go get cupcakes and I'll bring you right back? Did she walk away from school on her own, too embarrassed to show up without the cupcakes her class expected? And then someone snagged her up as they saw her walking down a street. Did she actually make it to school that day? Was her stepdad, Leron, telling the truth, or did he have something to do with her disappearance? And those that said they saw her on the playground were just mistaken? 
Laron died from what was believed to be a drug overdose in January of this year, 2021, at the age of 52. If he was withholding information on Alexis' disappearance, he, he took that info with him. In my opinion, I don't think Laron was responsible. If he was, I feel like they would have found evidence of it in the home, in his vehicle. They would have likely found something. That's just my opinion. I obviously don't know, but that's just the feeling I get, I guess. Laron played a significant part of the initial investigation because he was the last person that was with Alexis. Um, we have nothing to say that he was lying to us or not providing all of the information that he had. Um, so really, we don't know what kind of an impact his death would have on this. Also, the students in Crossing Guard say they saw her outside of the school that morning after Laron walked her there and then walked home. I do want to note that Highway 175 is less than a quarter mile away from where Alexis disappeared. So if someone did abduct her and then hit that highway, they could have been out of there very quickly and possibly in a different state by the time it was noticed that she was gone. Is Alexis alive out there living a new life under a different name? Was the DNA test done on Lisa accurate or is she possibly really Alexis and just doesn't want to leave the life she has now? There are so many unanswered questions. Let me know in the comments what you think. Would Alexis have been found had her story gotten the same national attention that Elizabeth Smart's case got. Now, I am not downplaying what happened to Elizabeth Smart at all. What happened to her was terrible and horrifying, and she deserved all the media attention she got. But Alexis deserved that same attention, and she didn't get it. Why? I'll tell you my opinion on why I think that is. Elizabeth was white. Her family had money, and she lived in a very nice neighborhood where people had money. Alexis was black. Her family wasn't rich, and she didn't live in a big, wealthy neighborhood. People of color often do not get the same attention when they go missing as white people do. They just don't. The New York Times and the Washington Post sent reporters to Utah to write about Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth's story was featured in the Boston Globe, the Miami Herald, and even newspapers in Australia. MSNBC provided hourly updates. The story was on CNN, NBC, Hardball with Chris Matthews. Everyone was on the edge of their seats wanting to know what happened to Elizabeth. There were no stories on Alexis in the New York Times or Washington Post. Her story was on America's Most Wanted, CNN, and it got on Fox News also, but they were short little mentions. There were 67 articles in magazines and newspapers on Alexis's disappearance, and most of these were done by the Associated Press. There were over 400 articles on Elizabeth by seemingly every news outlet out there. The media, for some reason, doesn't think missing people of color are newsworthy or exciting enough, I guess, and that's really frustrating, and I'm gradually losing my faith in humanity. Anyone with information regarding the whereabouts or circumstances of the disappearance of Alexis Patterson may contact the Milwaukee Sheriff's Office at 414-278-4788. A $10,000 reward is being offered for information leading to Alexis's whereabouts. You may also submit a tip online through the Black and Missing Foundation. I will have that website link in the description box. Please share the flyer for Alexis. As always, the link for that is down in the description box along with my sources. And also share this video if you think it will help. Let's keep her face out there and make sure Alexis is not forgotten and that her story is told because like I said before, not a lot of people know it. Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate every single one of you so much. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss when I upload a new missing video every week. And I gotta show you all this. My little girl made this for me and I promised her that I would show it in my next video when I asked people to sub. 
She did such a good job, and it was very sweet of her to make this for me, and I absolutely love it. If you want to see some of my previous videos, I would highly suggest checking out my entire missing playlist, as each case I cover is super important and hasn't gotten a lot of attention, and it deserves more exposure. They all do. As always, I mean absolutely no harm in covering these cases. I am simply trying to spread awareness. Someone out there knows what happened to Alexis and where she is. Perhaps even someone watching this video. So will you be the one who looks away or the one who does something about it? I will see you all next week. Mm -hmm.